On June 16, 2006, around 6.30 p.m., 16-year-old Chanel Petro Nixon went missing on what was Father's Day that year. Her loved ones would go from expressing gratitude for the patriarch of their family to on a citywide hunt for the honor roll student. Born on August 4, 1989, Chanel was the only girl of Lucita Petro Nixon and Anthony Garvin's three children. She was regarded for her intelligence and shy yet sweet demeanor. Though she was from Bedford-Stuyvesant, a rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, Chanel was no troublemaker. She made excellent grades, took time to study at the library after school, and was a dedicated churchgoer. So who would want to hurt such an outstanding young woman? The day of Chanel's disappearance, she was headed to fill out a job application at the local Applebee's and meet up with an old friend. If you're a Brooklynite like myself, then you already know the Applebee's I'm referring to is the one at Restoration. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Restoration Plaza is essentially a shopping center in Bed-Stuy built in the 1960s with the intent to close the racial wealth gap in central Brooklyn's lower income neighborhoods. That's their words, not mine. Back in the 90s, I distinctly remember them having a DKNY and this Applebee's among other things. And I see they have since gotten a facelift based on this picture because back then it looked like a dungeon and I really hated going there. Nonetheless, Chanel would unfortunately be abducted somewhere along the path from her home to the restaurant. What's so frustrating about this is that the street she traveled along is always bustling with people. So how was she able to be taken in broad daylight is beyond me. Her parents knew immediately that something wasn't right when Chanel failed to return home that evening. When they tried to report her missing, police insisted she ran away. Four agonizing days later, Chanel Petro Nixon's strangled body was located in Crown Heights. A landlord was planning to divide up a trash bag that sanitation said was too heavy for them to collect during their pickup that day. But once she opened it, she made the gruesome discovery of the straight-A student who sadly suffered a tragic fate. Police were notified and began their investigation, combing through her MySpace page and interviewing friends and neighbors. The social media account proved useless, and everyone spoke highly of her character, desires to be a nurse, and just how innocent she truly was. Her mom and best friend was aware of the person Chanel was planning to meet. This boy was a former classmate. He was named a person of interest right away, but despite inconsistencies in his statement, there was no hardcore evidence to charge him. With this challenge at hand, a $12,000 reward was offered by NYPD, Crime Stoppers, and 100 Blacks in Law Who Care to encourage people to come forward with any helpful information. The case would go cold, and over the next decade, Chanel's family, along with the community, and Reverend Al Sharpton continued to rally on the streets of New York, demanding justice for the slain teenager. Then, in 2016, a call from the island of St. Vincent would bust the case wide open. One of the locals informed PIX11 news reporter Mary Murphy that Veron Primus, the original person of interest in Chanel's disappearance and murder, was just arrested for holding a woman captive. That last tidbit was most important because the victim, Moana Hathaway, stated that Varan showed her a news clipping of Chanel's story and said he knew who did it. Given her own hostage situation at the time, Moana realized it was likely Varan who committed the crime. The NYPD cold case squad flew straight to St. Vincent to build a case against the offender for Chanel's death. Now, you may be wondering why Varon's sorry ass was even in the Caribbean anyway, but just hold on to your hats for this one. Like many other criminals, Varon had a history of unfavorable encounters with women. While living in New York some years after Chanel's murder, he was acquitted of essaying two women 
and a third woman filed an order of protection against him for attempting to hold her captive. He, of course, violated that, which landed him in jail, and they swiftly deported this idiot back to St. Vincent upon his release in May 2015. Varon wasn't reformed after doing his stint, and a short while into his relationship with Moana is when he went from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, holding her against her will for three and a half months. Moana was no fool, though. After being stuck in the basement with him for that time, she started to formulate a plan. He would only let her out to bring her to eat upstairs in the kitchen. And while he was cooking one day and he stepped outside to wash out a pot, she smartly placed an SOS note under an insulin bottle in the fridge for his aunt's caretaker to find. And yeah, you may have picked up on the fact that I said his aunt. She was living upstairs and she claims the whole time she was unaware that Moana was being held hostage in her home. Who knows what the truth is about that, but thank goodness that the caretaker took the note seriously and informed police. 33-year-old Charlene Graves was stabbed to death in the office of her real estate business. It's alleged that Varon confessed to a female cousin that he was consensually doing adult things with that he killed Charlene. Knives and Charlene's car key were recovered from his residence and assisted in his conviction for her November 2015 death. He claimed to have rented Charlene's car from her secretary, but that was later debunked. Varon was imprisoned in 2016 for this crime and subsequently sentenced to 34 years in prison at the 2022 trial. As of this year, 2024, Varon remains incarcerated for the heinous crime against Charlene Graves. Though he did manage to escape twice, he was hauled right back to the clink expeditiously both times. Varon has been indicted in absentia for the past eight years regarding Chanel's case. It is our hope that he will be extradited back to New York to stand trial for Chanel's murder once he completes his sentence in St. Vincent. Until then, I want us to send peace and love to Chanel Petro Nixon's family and friends as they wait for her killer to face the music. She has never been forgotten and never will be. If you liked learning more about today's case for episode two of my series, Forget Me Not, please hit the like button. Don't forget to comment and subscribe. I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments and any case suggestions. See you in two days for the first episode of my series, Angel Moms covering cases on women who lost their lives due to pregnancy or medical negligence.